Today's episode is brought to you by BCB Group. You're going to be hearing more about them later on in the show. But for now, here's my interview with Bilal Hafiz. Really glad to be joined by Bilal Hafiz, the founder of Macro Hive. Bilal, welcome to Forward Guidance. Thank you very much. And uh, great to, to finally be able to speak to you, Jack, as well. So my, my kind of core macro view is that we probably will see a peak in inflation in Q1 in the first part of this year. And inflation will, in general, fall over the course of 2022 in the US, in Europe, and, and around the world. So we, we're close to the peak in inflation, and we're going to see inflation fall. Underlying that is a view that the pandemic is, we're close to the end of the pandemic, and most countries will, will view the COVID as endemic, like a flu, and lots of restrictions will be limit, uh, lifted. So that's the inflation view. On the growth side, I think there's a very high chance that we could see a recession towards the end of this year. Uh, if not recession, at least a sharp slowdown. And that's driven by the fact that um, interest rates have moved up, oil prices are very high, which typically leads to slowdowns in, in growth. People are running out of savings. Um, there's been a big pickup in inventory building as well, which means that there's less need for production going forward. And there's less fiscal support for, for the economy as well. Now, what does that mean for markets? For equities, I think that we're going to have a tough year for equities. That means equities could be down, say, 5% this year or even 20% if, if we get to that recession scenario. So super defensive uh, environment for, for equities. Um, uh, and, and credit spreads in that context would also widen as well. So it's, it's a bad environment for both equities and credit. For interest rates, I think we're in this environment now where the market has priced hikes for almost every single meeting by the Fed. So I think now there'll be more two-way pricing for uh, the Fed at the front end. So I think the front end probably has seen some of its biggest moves already, and it, it's hard to still expect more Fed hikes to be priced. Um, the long end, I think, will be affected as we go towards the end of this year by, um, by the slowdown. And so long end yields are not necessarily going to explode higher to four or five percent i still think we're in this kind of lower you know two to two and a half percent range the dollar i think will weaken over the course of this year partly because the dollar has been helped a lot by flows into u.s equities um, and also by the fed pivoting early on to being hawkish now the rest of the world is pivoting to being hawkish so i think that will help other currencies against the the u.s dollar and then finally on um on crypto we're being much more tactical this year. This year is kind of a year for being tactical around crypto. So right now we're bullish on Ethereum um, and more neutral on, on, on Bitcoin. And you know, we'll be dynamic over the course of this year. You really have been in the weeds on institutional macro research uh, for a long time. And uh, you know, uh, uh, somewhat recently you, you uh, started looking into crypto with that very same rigor. Tell us your background. You, you've, you've worked at like pretty much, you know, you have an illustrious uh, CV uh, that I, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to interview. But you know, tell us about your background. And then also uh, maybe like what are some some like themes in not just, you know, your, your sort of you, you, where, where you worked, but like what are the themes? Like what, what drove you to, to get into research? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I basically studied economics at Cambridge uh, back in the 1990s. And I joined soon after university, I joined um, JP Morgan in, in around 1997, um, And I basically started off in foreign exchange research. Um, so it was quite common for if you studied economics at university at a place like Cambridge for you to go to work for a bank. And that's what I ended up doing. And uh, what I found was I just loved research. I mean, just the intellectual curiosity, you know, that, that aspect of it. And then also on top of that, uh, the, the good thing about markets are that your views get validated right or wrong very quickly. So, so unlike academic research where, it, you know, the, whether you're right or wrong, it's unclear whether that's actually the case or not. Uh, in markets, you're, you're right or wrong very quickly. So I, I really found my niche early on. I had a great early manager as well, um, an Argentinian chap called Alfonso Pratt Guy, who later went on to become the finance minister and central bank governor of Argentina. Um, so I was at JP Morgan for about four or five years. And then I left uh, JP Morgan in 2002 to join Deutsche Bank, who at the time were building out to become probably the biggest fixed income bank in the world. So so they were really building out their, all their products and everything. And I joined um, in foreign exchange in 2002. And my first half of my career at Deutsche, I spent a long time there up till about 2015. The first half of my career there, I, I ran foreign exchange research, uh, working on kind of macro and also quant research as well. I, I built a whole series of indices to trade currencies as well as coming up with macro views. 
then the global financial crisis hit in, in 2008, 2009, around that period. And then just after that, I moved to Asia, um, where I basically focused um, on FX um, and uh, rates markets in, in Asia, um, uh, with a particular focus on China. I spent uh, a long period uh, working with the Chinese on deregulating the markets, for example, and I ran uh, research out of Singapore there for a number of years. Then in 2012, I moved back to London with Deutsche, and there I set up a cross-asset research team. I did that for a couple of years, and I also was part of a, a research group um, that was servicing the CEO of Deutsche Bank. Um, then in 2015, I then left uh, Deutsche Bank to join Nomura, where I ran uh, international strategy or research there, in effect, at, uh, at Nomura in Europe, in London, uh, where I spent about three years there. So in total, I had you know, 20 plus years working in research, speaking to some of the biggest hedge funds in the world, biggest asset managers, big in sovereign wealth funds. Um, and it was a great, great experience. But what I found was... I, I kind of had done my time working for a big bank. And one of the things maybe not all of your listeners will quite appreciate is that after the global financial crisis, there was a huge amount of regulation of the financial sector, where suddenly the whole environment within a bank has changed to one where it's much more about uh, compliance, uh, rules, regulations, not doing anything that uh, could be risky in any way, even for researchers. And so in many ways, it became harder to do my job. You know, for me, being a good researcher is about there's a creative process around speaking to lots of different people, coming up with good ideas um, and, and using the latest kind of techniques, uh, you know, in on the, you know, on the quantitative side and applying them all. But banks didn't really have the same incentives as before to really encourage that. So so then I decided to leave working for a big bank and instead launch MacroHive, where I could continue to do research, continue to speak to the top investors in the world, but have a process that was optimized for that. Um, and one of my kind of basic philosophies there is that um, I don't have all the answers, but if I'm highly networked with a network of very smart people, I'll ultimately have the best ideas. And so I've structured MacroHive where we're highly networked, we're constantly in communication with top academics, top researchers, top investors, top policymakers, and we kind of have that virtuous cycle that we can come up with the best ideas. So, so you know, we started MacroHive in 2019. We've been going for about two, two and a half years. We produce research. We have a kind of high-end institutional research product, which is for top investors. So we have some of the, the biggest hedge funds in the world that you can uh, name. You know, we have them as clients and asset managers. And then we have a retail product, which is a more... Um, uh, uh, a more economical rate, uh, which is more skewed towards equities and crypto, of course, you know, which has become more popular recently. I'm really interested in what you said about the change after the great financial crisis. Uh, can you talk about uh, FX moves before and after the great financial crisis? I imagine, you know, a few years before you started in the industry, uh, you know, George Soros broke the Bank of England. And then in you had 1997, you had huge, insane moves, 80% moves in Asian currencies that just like rocked the financial world. In Russia, uh, you saw you know, financial contagion. People were beginning to learn about that. And then obviously 2008 was a huge black swan. But it seems like we really, other than perhaps, you know, a few weeks during March 2020, we really haven't had that uh, rip-roaring volatility after the great financial crisis. Uh, to what degree do you think that is just the the regulation on the banks as you mentioned is it central banks is it is it the you know the fundamentals have changed yeah no that, that's a very very good question um you know i think one big difference between the period say from the 70s 80s 90s to to now was that up until say the late 90s early 2000s you had lots of currency pegs which you know allowed speculators and investors to challenge the the central bank of that country or the or the finance ministry of that country to challenge the peg so a peg is when a country fixes its exchange rate against often the us dollar and it'll do whatever it takes to kind of maintain that peg so you know over the course of the 1990s as you mentioned in 97 before 97 many of the asian cur countries had uh, their currencies picked uh, pegged to the dollar now, if your business cycle is very aligned to the US dollar, then that can kind of work okay. But if you're misaligned in some ways, then there's a, a pressure point on your currency peg. 
And that's where all of these speculators like Soros, who did that with the, the pound peg to the Deutsche Mark in the early 90s, and then many other speculators or investors challenged the Asia pegs. Um, but by the early 2000s, a lot of those pegs were gone. Um, and instead, what you had was you had managed floats, you know, so what you had was Asian central banks were saying, OK, we won't have a, a hard peg. Instead, we'll just intervene constantly to smooth the volatility in the market against the US dollar. So that was really going on from the early 2000s onwards, and you had less and less pegs. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of one big reason why you didn't have as much of these big swings as you had before. Um, of course, around the global financial crisis, you had some huge swings in currencies, as you would expect. Um, but since then, one, one of the reasons why um, outside of COVID, as you mentioned, we haven't had as big a moves is that interest rates, which are you know, perhaps one of the biggest drives of currencies, have converged to the same rates around the world. So you know, the European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, the Fed, everyone's doing the same thing. They all cut rates to zero, do QE. And, and it's very difficult for currencies to exhibit strong trends in, in that environment. So that's been one of the big, big factors. So you could say it's a fundamental factor. It doesn't say that this will be the same you know, situation forever, but it does tell you that um, having central banks all have the same interest rate is not great for currency trends. Mm, yeah. And so you talked about FX, that's foreign exchange or currencies. You also said rates, which is like your interest rates on, on bonds, yields, and then fixed income, which is bonds. So it's all sort of this stew of macro. That, and that, that's why you, when you said you worked in cross asset, that makes sense. Because if you own a, a Chinese government bond, you obviously have a view on whether what, what, what the yuan is, is doing. So you said interest rates are now all sort of the same. That's true in developed markets. But in emerging markets, you know, uh, central banks have been hiking. I believe the rate in Brazil is now like 10, 11 percent. Um, um, rates in Turkey are, are quite high as well. So if, if carry, in other words, uh, borrowing in a cheap currency, bar borrowing in a low interest rate currency and investing it in a, so in a, a higher uh, interest rate bearing a currency, so like borrowing dollars to invest in Brazilian real bonds, if carry were the only thing, then the real should appreciate against the dollar. But obviously there are other factors. So can you, can you just lay out what are sort of the other factors? Because it's, it's hard. You know, I feel like I'm maybe I'm like I have a, like a level one understanding of macro where I'm like okay when there's risk off the dollar goes up commodity currents to perform poorly the yen is sort of its its own thing but like what actually moves currencies you know other than just carry and and risk sentiment yeah no that's a very good question I mean the first point I would, I would just make about carry is that in general over time it tends to be quite a profitable strategy and so whether it's a carry in um, FX markets or carry in rates markets you know investors love to get carry they love to earn that small amount of money every single day to sort of, and compound those returns over time. So, so it's a very powerful, you know, type of return. And if you had invested in a basket of FX carry trades over time, often the returns have been almost similar to equity markets. So it kind of tells you the sort of the power of this all. So for sure, the level of interest rates and the carry is a big driver of currencies. But outside of that, the other big driver are expectations of changes in interest rates. So even if a country has very low interest rates, so it's not really a carry currency, so nobody's going to buy that currency because of their interest rates. Um, if the central bank is expected to raise rates, then that often is positive for the currency. And so, you know, trying to understand what the central bank will do becomes quite important for not only interest rate markets, but also currency markets. So, so interest rates have two, you know, effects on currencies. One is the level of interest rates. If they're high, it's attractive for, for the currency. And then the change in the interest rate is also a big driver. Then outside of that, the other big driver of currencies are um, uh, cross-border capital flows. So if a country's equity markets um, are very attractive, you know, because they're going up a lot, or there's a big theme that benefits that uh, that uh, that country. Then you suddenly start to see flows come into that country. So foreigners or international investors start buying equities in that country, and then the currency goes up. So, so the question then is, what drives those cross-border capital flows? Um, so obviously, expected strong returns in the equity market are one. Now, what drives the equity market? You could say growth. So then that tells you that you know high growth countries should generally see stronger currencies. Um, another big driver of currencies are the, the the trade account or the trade balance or current account of a country. So if a country is an exporter of commodities and commodity prices go up a lot, 
then uh, the currency tends to go up uh, as well. So then there's a link between commodity prices, the trade account, so countries' exports go up, and then the, the currency as well. So that's, that's another channel that's, that's very important um, as well. And, and, you know, in some ways, kind of something that looms behind every currency is inflation, you know, because if there's an expectation that the country is engaging in lots of policies that will you know, will debase the currency, will lead to rampant inflation, then nobody wants to touch that currency. And we've seen that with Turkey more recently, where the central bank has basically said, even though we have high inflation, we're going to ignore it. If anything, we're going to cut interest rates and just let it rip. Then the currency just gets smashed in, in that environment. So over the, over the very long run, a country that runs very high inflation will end up having a, a much weaker currency. Right. And it's all sorts of these factors that affect the, the currency swing and it, it can't just be one so if you focus just on one you can always think of counter examples for example the u.s has run a trade deficit for about 50 years and the dollar has been quite strong likewise like a country like turkey i bet it probably has pretty high gdp growth but obviously that currency has been very weak i'm really glad you brought up inflation uh because that has been at the forefront uh over the past year we've had some deflation in early 2020 and lots of concerns, huge fiscal spending packages around the world, uh, coordinated with central bank monetary easing, not just lowering rates, but also expanding balance sheets. And now we are at inflation. I believe in the U.S. we had a 9.7% year over year uh, uh, rise in the producer price index. Uh, um, we have, uh, you know, we have a seven handle on the CPI in the U.S. You're much, you're much more in tune in, in what's going on in Europe, but but you know, inflation there is is high as well. And you know, can you can you uh, Maybe, yeah, yeah, can you start with by laying out your thesis on how you've made sense of uh, inflation as a global phenomenon over the past year, year and a half? And then I want to really dig into Europe. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the way I, I, I sort of think about inflation is that we've had this long period of very, very low inflation or relatively low inflation. So if we take the US as our example here. So inflation has been around, say, 2% or even less than 2% for the last like 20, 30 years. Um, there's been some volatility around that. Sometimes it goes up to 3, 4. Um, but we haven't really seen a seven handle in headline CPI inflation since the early 1980s. So obviously, that's that's been a big shock. Um, at the same time, one has to also appreciate the how quickly inflation has changed. So in January of last year, so at the start of 2021, US inflation was around one and a half percent, 1.4 percent. By the end of of the, of the year, it was closer to 7 percent. So that's a huge increase in inflation that we've seen over a short space of time. Now, the question is, what's driving that? And in my view, all of this is linked to the pandemic one way or the other. And um, essentially what the pandemic did was that it restricted the supply of goods around the world in different ways so it was factories were shut down or not operating at full capacity so there was less supply of goods ships weren't coming to port quickly enough the last mile you know van deliveries to to, to people's houses wasn't happening um and that's been affected by the pandemic um and and then the other side was the demand side where people you know, because people were staying at home, uh, whether out of choice or whether there was some kind of government restrictions, people suddenly um, weren't consuming services. They were no longer going to the cinema, going to restaurants. Instead, they were using their spare money then to buy goods. And so you had this massive increase in goods demand, which was then turbocharged in the in the case of the US with uh, um, the, the Biden and the earlier Trump fiscal stimulus, which essentially gave checks to people. And so people's income actually went up during a slowdown during the COVID period, which was unusual. Normally during economic slowdowns or increases in unemployment, people's incomes fall. In this case, it went up because people ended up earning more through government checks than they were normally. So you had this turbocharged demand, you had restrictions to supply. And you, if you throw into the mix a massive oil shock, so we've had the biggest percentage increase in oil prices since the 1970s. So this is like 1970s style oil shock. If you throw that all together, you, you've ended up where we are today with very high you know, inflation. Um, now, my, my sense is, um, and there's a big debate in, in markets around this all and by policymakers about is this transitory or not. And my, my take of this is that the forces that have caused this high inflation are transitory, are temporary. Now, what has surprised many of us, uh, myself included, was how long the pandemic has lasted. 
you know, so I was kind of hoping that the pandemic would have kind of subsided completely by last summer. Instead, it's carried on with Omicron and people are still wearing masks in the US. Kids are still wearing masks. Um, in in Germany, there's restrictions around, um, you know, uh, large uh, venues. You know, you can't fully attend uh, stadiums, uh, sports events and so on. So there's still restrictions, even though we've had almost two years of the pandemic. And because of that, you know, we've still seen these factors that have caused, you know, high, high inflation. But my sense is as the pandemic does ease and it does look like Omicron is now a variant which is closer to the flu, countries will start to lift all those restrictions and will suddenly start to get much more freer supply and we'll get some normalization in demand. And then inflation will start to come back down um, uh, again as well. I mean, one, one thing, you know, we, we have to sort of note is on the consumption side, the amount Americans spent on goods over the last year or two was the equivalent of 10 years worth of goods consumption. I mean, this this has been the biggest uh, purchase of goods in world history over this over such a short space of time. We've never seen this ever happen before. Um, and, and it's happened at a time when there's a pandemic where, where people weren't able to, you know, go to factories or, you know, man ships and so on. Um, so that that's kind of the context. And so my, my kind of view overall is there's been these very sort of unique factors that have sort of driven this all. Um, but in the end, these are temporary factors. And so I'd expect inflation to, to start to fall. Yeah. And the fact that we've had huge goods inflation, whereas demand for services uh, has, has not kept a pace, that is a total opposite of what we've seen for the past 20 years, where actually you've seen goods deflation. You know, the cost of a TV used to cost like $1,000, you know, t t 20 years ago. Now it's very cheap. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the cost of services like uh, healthcare education has, has gone up steadily. However, as you say, we, we have the exact opposite where no one is going on cruises. You know, uh, people are going to fewer restaurants uh, less frequently. However, they are ordering a lot of TVs from their house. So the price of TVs going up, that makes sense. And then you have the oil shock, commodity shock, uh, perhaps some you know, underinvestment in, in commodities. That, that's maybe a secular theme. But my question is, how come the rise in the prices of goods hasn't been uh, offset by a deflation in services you know if, if cruises if no one's going on cruises how come the prices of cruises aren't just way lower is it the fact that the cruise companies are keeping them artificially high and you know the cpi you know the the the, uh, the, the uh, um, bureau of labor statistics isn't marking like the true clearing price of a cruise is you know 10 percent of what it used to be you know three years ago or or, or is it something else no no, no that, that's a very good point and i think you know part of that is um there's been a challenge in general for statistics bodies to measure things where that uh, where that service is not actually active. So, you know, so for example, there's a component, you know, within CPI, which is about uh, the cost of tickets to go to a stadium. Now, for there were large stretches of time over the last year or two where you, nobody was allowed to go to a stadium, yet they've had to show some kind of price for that. And they have their kind of ways of kind of averaging, you know, the, the data between the point where they could measure it and uh, the point, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, it's sort of extrapolated from that. So, so I think part of it is an element of how do you measure a price of something which isn't traded. Um, and then the other side of this is that uh, services, um, we, we have seen kind of the reopening dimension of services. So I could put it almost the other way around, which is that we've had phases of reopenings in the US and other parts of the world where prices of services have gone up, but they haven't necessarily gone up as much as what we saw in the goods sector. So, for example, in core goods in, in the US, which is goods, inflation, excluding um, uh, excluding energy prices, if you adjust for base effects, because as you, as you said, you know, in 2020 prices went down. So to make adjustments for that, core goods has been, you know, rising at about 7% annualized. Whereas services, core services has been annualizing around two and a half percent, which is where it was before the pandemic. So what you haven't seen is you haven't seen this big handoff from goods to services, even when the economy is reopened. And if you go back to the 1970s, you know, which is the reference point everyone uses for, you know, a decade of very high inflation for a long period of time, back then, services inflation was actually higher than goods inflation for most of that decade. But we're seeing no evidence of that happening this time around. And so for me, you know, uh, aside from the measuring issues, what what's what's what seems to be um, uh, very kind of powerful right now is that services prices just aren't going up fast enough to 
uh, match what we're seeing in goods. And to me, that kind of gives you more confidence that what we're seeing now is more for a relative price change between sectors rather than a, a generalized broad base inflation boom that we're going to see for the next five, 10 years. So what is your outlook on when um, inflation will peak? And I, I guess we should start dis disaggregating. Um, you know, there's the US, um, Europe, and you know, inflation is really has been a, a global phenomenon. Uh, let's just start with the US. You know, I, 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 people have been talking about peak inflation for a long time, and it, it hasn't happened yet. I know base effects are in the favor of the transitory camp because you know, you know, uh, well, maybe, maybe you can explain that better than I can. But uh, yeah, what, what are you? Uh, what's your outlook on the U.S. inflation for 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 you know the the near term? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so just on the base effects, I mean, essentially, what, all that means is that say in 2020, prices fell to very low levels, which meant that almost any price changes in 20, last year would have led to big year on year changes. Um, in inflation. So at the start of last year, start of 2021, inflation was around one, one and a half percent, which just made it much easier for inflation to go up to 5% by the end of the year. But now this year, the reverse effect will kick in where because prices have gone up so much, it, it will be much harder for prices to continue to go up at this rate going forward. So, so by around Q2 onwards, the base effects will start to roll over. So even if inflation is still going up quite a lot month on month, because of base effects, the year-on-year -year change will start to go down in, in the case of the US. Now, as it happens, um, the way I think about this is one of the reasons why this inflation turn hasn't happened sooner is because the pandemic has lasted longer than we've all thought. You know, China has a zero COVID policy. Germany still has restrictions. You, you know, in the US, there's still lots of different restrictions. And even if there aren't restrictions people are still altering their behavior because of the pandemic. You know, they may be staying home more than they would otherwise. Um, they may be more risk averse. And so to some extent, to answer the question of when is peak inflation, you have to answer the question of when is the pandemic fully endemic and is viewed like a flu and everyone behaves more, more, you know, more normally sort of thereafter. Now, I'm making the assumption that we're close to that point now. And I'm using the case of, um, if you look at, say, the UK, the country where I live, the UK view is that the uh, Omicron is now uh, endemic and essentially all restrictions will be lifted in the next four or five weeks. So already lots of restrictions have been lifted, but even within a month, there will not even be a requirement to self-isolate in the UK. So the UK is taking this view that it's fully endemic. And I think other countries will start to follow the, the UK approach. And so within a few months, I think a lot of the pandemic effects will start to sort of go away. And that makes it easier then to take the view that we should start to see inflation uh, fall as the year goes on. So my sense is Q2 will be an important turning point for inflation. One is the base effects kick in. And secondly, we'll have more clarity around the pandemic becoming endemic. And then um, as we go towards the end of the year, the, the other reasons why I think inflation will start to fall is because the, the big uh, increase in savings that people have built up because of in the US because of all the fiscal checks and, and so on, that will all have been spent and there's no new checks coming to people's houses, you know, anymore. On top of that, if you look at supply chain dynamics around the world, you see that, uh, you know, shipping rates have fallen quite significantly over the last three, four months, which tells you that some of the bottlenecks have started to disappear. If you look at the components of the purchasing PMI indices, it tells you that the backlog of orders is starting to fall. And in the US, there was a really big restocking or inventory build in Q4 of last year, which tells you that companies have really started to build up their inventories, which in general should mean there should be less price pressures on on um, on goods in general, because companies have excess stock to, to some extent. The wild card within all of this is really oil prices to some extent, you know, um, my sense is that, you know, we, we may go to $100, but we won't get to $200, you know. So in the last year, we've had, we've had almost like a 50 to 80% rise in oil prices. And that, that's very inflationary. In January alone, there was a 15% increase in oil prices. Uh, my sense is we won't get those similar increases every month thereafter. And that will be another factor that will cause uh, in inflation to start to roll over. And, okay, so that's in the, the U.S. And even though in the U.S. we have a 40-year high in inflation, the U.S. has some uh, fixed income holders, I should say, have some buffer because the 10 year is at a extremely high level, let's say, of, of 2 percent, uh, the 10 year uh, Treasury note yield. However, the, the note, let's say, on a German Bund yield is 30 basis points. And the part of the reason that Europe could sort of get away, if you can use that phrase, with very low you know, fixed income rates is because Europe was a very low inflation 
uh, a decade because of slow growth, demographics, you know, uh, older people, they have fewer kids, a lot of reasons we, you know, maybe we can get into. But now uh, inflation has returned to the European continent. So uh, what what sticks out to you? I mean, you know, the majors are, are Germany, France, uh, um, the UK. But I mean, I, I even think, you know, I, there's some outliers like didn't, you know, Spain has had a producer price index one month of something like 17%. I mean, uh, what is, is this sort of is this changing the game here? And, uh, you know, how, how disturbing could this be to European fixed income markets? I know maybe perhaps was, it was, uh, you know, maybe seven or seven days ago or so, uh, there was a huge, huge backup in European rates, right? Huge. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, I think the story in Europe is that, you know, Europe didn't really see, didn't really see the same fiscal transfer that you saw in the US. So, in the US, essentially, the, the way the US government dealt with COVID was to give everyone checks, irrespective of their earnings. And that ended up leading to people having a higher income uh, from the checks than they had before. In Europe, the approach was the f- what they call the furlough scheme, which was that the government would uh, replace the wages, uh, would pay people's wages that companies were paying. So people's income didn't go up in the same way as it did in the US. So in Europe, you haven't had this same sort of excess demand for goods uh, in the same way as you've had in the US. Instead, the, the biggest shock for Europe has really been more on the energy side, you know, because energy prices have gone up a lot. Europe imports all of its energy, unlike, say, the US, and it's been affected by, and also Europe has uh, a lot of more sort of climate change policies where they were trying to move away from fossil fuels, but they didn't have enough renewables, so they miscalculated completely. And so they've ended up having to buy coal and uh, oil at outrageous prices. Um, China was also moving away from coal and uh, essentially secured a lot of the natural gas supplies around the world, which left Europe having to pay much higher prices. So there's been more of an energy story in Europe. Um, if you exclude if you exclude energy from the inflation sort of side in Europe, uh, core inflation in Europe is is around two point three percent. So it's high, but it's not like the US where it's say six percent core inflation. So you know energy pushes up to like four four and a half in in euro area. So so the European story is really an energy story more than anything else. There is some inflationary pressures, you know. So so for sure, it's higher than it was before the pandemic, where core inflation was closer to one. But the main problem for Europe is really energy. Um, now, what does that mean for rates markets and the ECB? Now, the ECB has signaled that it will likely, well, it's, it seems to be more open to the possibility of raising rates by the end of this year. But they seem to be pushing back on being as aggressive as the US. Um, they've been very clear that they view this more as transitory, unlike, say, the US. Um, and they understand also that's more of an energy issue as well. So, so far, they've kind of been holding back a bit. Um, and the, the reason for Bunil's going up wasn't necessarily so much because of inflation per se. It was more to do with the ECB appearing to open the door to rate hikes, which suddenly allowed the whole interest rate curve to sort of jump up in, in a way that it wasn't able to before. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, to what degree is it sort of like chicken causes the egg? Because you know, some people say, oh, let's say let's take the U.S., uh, the the market has tightened the monetary conditions for the Fed, but the Fed has been the one whispering in every reporter and bond trader, you know, in the world, saying we're going to raise rates, we're going to raise rates, and they sort of want it to happen. So, you know, when you say it has an inf- inflation that caused rates to go up, it was expectations of the ECB hiking rates. I mean, it was the, the ECB put out those expectations of hiking rates because of inflation, right? So it's sort of like it's all it's all one arrow yeah. causing another. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the end, it's it, they're both connected with each other. For sure, the inflation numbers themselves cause a big problem that they've been higher for longer than they had expected. Um, but also there's been a change in rhetoric. It's been mo- most noticeable in the US, where initially the US was just ignoring high prints. And then from around June last year onwards, with the, the move up in their dots in their forecasts, the Fed has been you know slowly moving much more towards um, a view that inflation is more persistent. So it's a combination of both. But what you do see is that the market tends to react much more strongly to uh, days where you have the Fed or the ECB speaking than it does when you have an inflation data release. So that tells you that uh, the market is ultra sensitive to what the central bank says. So the reaction function is very important. Now, of course, the central bank is affected by inflation. Um, so there, there you get a circularity. But not only that, I would also say, and this is uh, especially the case uh, with 
the US, but also Europe as well, that there's a political context to inflation as well, that there's a lot of pressure from politicians for to tell central banks, you have to do something about inflation because the public is very worried about inflation. And while we, while we like to think that central banks are independent, they are they're not really independent. They're they're constantly responding to public opinion, to what politicians are saying, and and this there's been a very clear shift in terms of um, public opinion towards inflation, which has affected how central banks react. This episode is brought to you by BCB Group, Europe's leading provider of crypto friendly business banking for institutions in the crypto space. They also provide trading services, allowing you to trade FX and cryptocurrency quickly and at scale. They specialize in efficient execution of large orders in illiquid markets. So if you are an institution looking to make high volume trades, you need to check out BCB Group because a great trade idea is worth nothing if you can't execute it. And that is exactly what BCB Group helps you to do. Their mission is to empower the global financial revolution through sustainable and innovative banking. Really glad to have them as a sponsor. So if you want to take control of your digital assets, please check them out at bcbgroup.com slash jack. That's bcbgroup.com slash jack. Thank you. And let's get back to the show. Yeah. And um, we've had a huge uh, tightening of of short-term rates with expectations of hikes from the the, the Fed and the ECB. Let's just look at the Fed. Um you know the Fed is is pricing in some the excuse me the Fed funds futures market is pricing in something like six rate hikes uh, for 2023 and then there's the terminal rate which is so six rate hikes would be uh, 150 to 175 because uh, it's a range of a target range and you know now we're at zero to 25 basis points uh, and the idea is it can only go 25 basis points at a time although maybe that's that's wrong um, to what degree do you think that you know that's fully priced in, you know, obviously it's been a phenomenal trade to go short euro dollar futures or to sort of bet that the Fed would hike, hike rates. But the trade has moved so much in the favor of those betting in, in that direction that you know, how much juice is left in that trade? I think my sense is a lot of that juice is gone. Um, we actually put on uh, a trade to go short the front end uh, to, you know, to anticipate this Fed hikes around April last year. So we put a curve flattener on and um, that was a time, if you recall, where everybody was so worried about inflation that people were putting steepness on. So they were expecting the 10-year yield to go up much faster than the two-year yield because they thought that the central bank was behind the curve. So the front end would stay very low. Um, and it's really the long end that would scream higher. Uh, instead, the opposite to happen. We've had this huge flattening because the market has never really believed that the we're entering a new high inflation regime. So longer longer term interest rates are basically telling you that they don't really see a big inflation problem. They don't see a return to the 1970s, which is our view. Um, and at the same time, the front end has shot up because the Fed's been reacting to the high inflation numbers and increasing its hawkishness. So we've had this massive curve flattening. Now, recently, we've exited that view. So one or two weeks ago, we thought it's time to get out of that trade because, number one, it's it's done very well. But also, now that every single meeting this year has been priced in by, by you know for a hike by the Fed, that's, you know, from almost pricing like one hike, one or two hikes this year to every single meeting having, having a hike. Just from a risk return perspective, it just tells you that it's harder now to get as much juice from, from that trade. The other concern I have is that I think there's a high chance that as we go into the second half of this year, the economic growth numbers are going to start to look a lot weaker. And so that if that was to happen, then you suddenly the, the hikes at a price for the later meetings in this year could get priced out. So I think we're in this two way phase now where it's you could see arguments for rate hikes to be taken out of the, the, the this year or they could be added on. And so it's more two way now. So for me, it's you, you kind of have to be a bit more cautious on how you play play this all. And there's some. Uh, inversion in the Fed funds futures curve, the euro dollar curve, that it's somewhat mild now. But I'm just looking at the Fed funds probability, the midpoint range of a of a 200 to 225 basis points for March of 2023 is 27.3, whereas for um, let's see uh, what, uh, July it's 24.5 percent. So it's a few basis points inversion, and you know the interpretation is that on a probability adjusted basis, the market is pricing in that the Fed will net net have to cut rates. Rather than raise them, because, you know, and the interpretation, the narrative is that the Fed will cause a recession, so it will have to to cut rates. Uh, to what degree is that is that uh, you know, obviously it's possible, but how are you sort of hand handicapping those odds? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think this this whole business cycle, if you just step back, has has really been a strange one because, you know, COVID was obviously a huge shock, a huge recession, um, but it wasn't really a normal recession, you know, because people's income went up, people stock markets went up very quickly, you know, wages went up, house values, you know, went up. I mean, so it wasn't really like a normal recession, and so. One of the challenges, I think, when we look at, say, the terminal rate and these rate hikes and everything is, did COVID, uh, you know, reset the business cycle so that, you know, we say, okay, COVID was the deep recession and we're now at the beginning of a new business cycle, a new expansion that started in in like April, May 2020, and we're just at the beginning of, of a new expansion? Or did the COVID, uh, you know, COVID shock just uh, interrupt the slowdown that was already happening, the Fed was already cutting rates before COVID because there was a slowdown coming and the curve had inverted and there was a recessionary fears. And so we're late cycle right now. And I think the market is trying to juggle the two. Are we early in an expansion or are we very late in, 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 in the cycle? And so the market's kind of schizophrenic about which one are we in. And in some ways, what's interesting is that the market is essentially pricing a terminal rate of around 2%. So the highest rate we got to was 2.5% in the last hiking cycle. But 2% was where the Fed was before COVID started. So the market is almost saying that we're going to just go back to where we were just before COVID, which was late cycle. That's what the market is saying in some ways. Um, and that tells you how strange this this whole cycle is. It's, you know, it, it's not really a proper recession. It was more like a unexpected, long holiday for the world that suddenly happens and the holidays ended and now we're kind of trying to work out where we are in the cycle. So so I think that's one of the reasons why the market is, is, is trying to do this funny way of pricing everything. The other strange thing is we've never really had the start of a Fed hiking cycle where the curve has been so flat going into into the first Fed hike. So it's almost as if the market is just fine tuning the cycle so much, even before the Fed's even started, the market's saying it's going to have to end at that point, it's going to be a recession. So it tells you just how um, uh, how forward looking the markets are trying to be in this environment. Um, now, of course, we know if you look historically that the market almost always overprices hikes. There's there's this sort of constant what's called term premia. So the market's constantly overpricing hikes. It's that happened almost all, all the time. So that also tells you that what the Fed will end up delivering this year may end up being less than what the market's pricing. So there's there's kind of two different things we're trying to do here. We're, we're trying to work out what will the Fed actually do, and on top of that, what is the market going to what's the market going to price the Fed to do? You know, there, there's kind of lots of moving parts here. So so that's a roundabout way of saying that I do think that uh, the market is fair in terms of pricing that chance of a recession. I do think there's probably around a 40% chance of a recession in the, you know, uh, in the latter part of this year and H1 of next year. Um, the market, I would say, is probably assigning a, a lower probability of like 15% or 20%. So I, I'm giving a high probability of that recession. Um, so it's telling you the market is starting to come around to this view that there is this chance of, of, of a recession. Yeah, uh, the, the big story is recession risk on your on your radar. I mean, what, what does that look like? Like, how do we see do we start to see some deflation? Uh, uh, do, does uh, unemployment start to pick up? How much damage are we going to see in asset markets? How wide are credit spreads going to blow out? Is the dollar going to rally? Is it not? Um, yeah, let's let's get into asset markets. Uh, let's let's yeah, just, I'm just I'll just start with Jerry. How, you know, how bad do you think it's going to get? I mean, some some recessions, like, for example, I mean, a, a true recession, I guess, is very bad. But like, you know, we had a slowdown in 2016 and, and the, the world didn't fall off a cliff, right? Um, but, you know, how bad do you think it's going to get? What I will say is that I think the next 12 months are going to be very challenging for risk markets. So whether that's credit or equity markets, I think there's a high chance that um, that we'll see poor returns over the course of the year. Now, whether that poor returns means we'll be down 5% this year or 20%, it's hard to say right now. Um you know, uh, part of that will depend on how aggressive the Fed is. You know, will the Fed continue to hike rates even if equity markets are weakening? So that's one big factor. And we, we aren't quite sure what the Fed's view is on, on equity. So far, they seem to be quite comfortable with weak equity markets. The other side of this equation is we don't quite know how the US consumer is going to behave going forward because 
we know that they built up some savings, so there's some buffer there that they could use. But at the same time, if you look at the distribution of the saving, it seems like the consumers who tend to spend money, um, who are the poorer households, the lower quartile households, they, they've run out their excess savings. It's, it's really the, the richer end of the spectrum that still have excess savings from the COVID period. So that tells you that uh, people are starting to run out of purchasing power. You know, either they, they don't have savings to dip into, and on top of that, their earnings have been falling in real terms. Um, so their purchasing power has been falling. Um, at the same time, when you look at companies, what they're telling you is that they're facing higher costs uh, are sort of coming in. And last year, they were able to maintain very large profit margins because the consumer was able to buy the stuff because they had all this extra savings. Now, this year, margins could be pressured because companies may not be able to keep prices so high. So what that tells you is that you could have this combination of falling margins and uh, not necessarily falling prices, but prices not going up as much. So that's more disinflationary trends, narrowing margins. And when you're in that environment, you can quite quickly go into a down 20% environment very quickly. So I think, you know, there is this real chance that we could have like a down 20% year. Um, you know, on top of that, the other thing you have to remember is that if you look at the activity of retail investors in particular, they've been huge uh, buyers of equities over the last year or two years. You know, equities and crypto, they've piled into that in a way that they didn't do before COVID. So that tells you there's a lot of froth in the market. There's a lot of people who have invested in, in markets who aren't necessarily that experienced. And so when you have that type of player in the market, it's very easy for some market volatility to cause those types of investors to run away and sell everything. And then you get these sharper declines. And to to what degree do you think there'll be dispersion in, in the returns? I mean, you know, uh, a feature, let's say, in the U.S. markets is that growth, uh, there's been a big uh, 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 um, flow out of growth stocks into value stocks, out of expensive and into cheap, out of, you know, electric vehicle stocks and into oil stocks, for, for example. And it just sort of, commodities have done really well, those values are sort of cheap um, companies that you typically don't think commodity companies do well during a slowdown, but they have done extremely well. Meanwhile, it's been this sort of, uh, you know, speculative growth names um, that really have, have struggled does that make sense during a slowdown? Typically, I I thought I mean you know what do I know? But I, I I thought the narrative was sort of that it was it was growth that does better during slowdowns. Do you have a do you have a view on that? So you know what we had after COVID was an environment of very low interest rates, very low long term interest rates, which really helps tech companies, and it and it kind of helps companies that don't have much earnings. You know because if interest rates are very low, you can basically. Uh, you know, rely more on the future of their earnings because it doesn't really matter if interest rates are low, then the future and the present kind of collapse into one. And so you can just say, okay, in the future, we're going to make lots of earnings and investors will be fine because there's not a big opportunity cost for investors to have to put their money in bonds. So so we had this really nice environment where um, interest rates were low, it helped tech. And on top of that, the world went remote and everything went virtual and in the cloud. So that was really a perfect environment for, for, for tech to do well. Um, and that was during the, the bounce after COVID. And so what that means is as we you know, go into an environment of high interest rates, and on top of that, a world away from the pandemic, so we get back to reality, back to the real world, then that's really quite a bad mix for those growth and techie type companies. So, so you know, it matters where we're coming from. The other point about the value side is that if you look at really what the value sectors are, in reality, they're really banks and energy stocks. Now, banks do well when interest rates go up, and that's what we've been seeing. Um, and energy companies do well when oil prices go up. And, you know, this cycle, we've seen oil prices shoot higher. So as soon as oil prices start to go sideways or down, then those energy stocks will be hit. And as soon as interest rates stop going up, then banks will be hit. So to some extent, you know, we're in this sweet spot right now for value, you know, because interest rates are going up, you know, the Fed's raising rates, you know, that that gives banks more things to do with the, the interest rate curve and energy prices are going up. But I think by the second half of this year, those drivers will start to go away. You know, energy prices probably by then will start to go sideways or down and interest rates won't be going up as much as they, they are. Um, and then on top of that, if we are going to a slowdown, then we might start to see more defaults uh, as well, which could start to hurt banks uh, too. Um, now, the, the only thing I would say around defaults are 
and it, this is one of the reasons why I've always been a bit more hesitant about uh, um, uh, about the Fed causing inflation. Like many people have said that the reason we have high inflation now is not so much to do with the lockdown or supply chain issues. It's really to do with the central bank. It's the Fed has massively expanded its balance sheet. M2 growth is very high. If you're printing money, inflation goes up. And for me, that's quite a simplistic way of looking at things because money in reality is uh, the ability for the guy in the street to borrow money very easily and for credit in the in the broader sense to really go up a lot in an economy. And what we haven't seen over the last year or two is much lending, bank lending to households. That hasn't really happened. There's been credit growth to households has actually been lower than economic growth, which is quite unusual. So credit growth hasn't really exploded higher to households. And so that tells you that when you see this reversal, banks don't really have a huge amount of credit exposure to households, at least. So if there is a slowdown, you won't really get a huge amount of defaults from the household sector because they weren't really borrowing like crazy. Instead, there has been some credit that's gone to corporates. So companies have borrowed some. So there could be some, some sort of pockets of, of defaults there. Um, and obviously, uh, companies have been issuing uh, corporate bonds. So on the capital market side, there could be some some sort of uh, defaults there as well. Um, so yeah, so that that's kind of a, a, an overall take on some of the, the way the sectors could play out. If we do have a recession, uh, then what I'm about to ask you will sound very stupid. But what, just to push back, uh, to play devil's advocate, uh, to what degree has the uh, relatively small amount of bank lending, bank lending to consumers since March of 2020 been not because consumers credit is bad, but because consumers have credit. So they don't, sorry, they have money, so they don't need credit. In other words, the fact that people are running out of money, they actually will start borrowing. Banks will start lending. No, that's a very good point. And uh, again, it's one of those circularities here. It's hard to know which one comes first. Um, what I would say is that if you look at where there has been lots of, sort of borrowing, um, there has been lots of borrowing in the financial market. So if you look at margin borrowing, um, things like that, there has been a lot of leverage on that side of things, whether that's crypto, equities, and so on. So that tells you that people, that there has been some lending and the lending has really gone into financial speculation more so than in terms of in, in the real economy. Now you could say that as people's checks get you know, uh, run out in you know, the fiscal checks, then people will want to borrow more. The question then is, will banks have the appetite to lend to the households or not? Now, banks claim that they are willing to lend, um, but time will tell whether they will. Um, you know, what you have seen is banks since COVID, what they've been much more comfortable doing is rather than lending to households, they've been much more comfortable lending to the government, buying treasuries. And so that's that's generally been the case for the last two years. And so time will tell whether they will suddenly pivot and say, okay, instead of lending to, you know, the, the government will actually lend to people instead. Um, so we'll, we'll see that switch switch happens. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that, I believe you, you definitely know more about this than I do is because reverse, reverse uh, repo rates is lower than treasury yield. So banks, just, they, they, they seek yield where it is. So I, it's not like banks love treasuries. You know, I think, I've I've heard this. You know, oh, banks they love treasuries. Banks are betting on a recession. You got to trust where the banks. It's like the, it's, the deals are higher. You know, and you're right. You're right that they're not not lending consumer. Of course, they and they always have the ability to to that. And there's you know reserves is, has not really been a problem since 08. No, 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 that, no. That's a fair point. And uh, you know what, what I would say there is that the 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 nature of the re reverse repo rate and in general the nature of the sort of regulatory system is such that it's often easier for a bank to earn that carry from buying treasuries and repoing it or from using the reverse repo you know so, so facility um, so the incentive structure is such that banks are incentivized more to use these facilities to get some kind of uh, more attractive risk return than to lend to households um, and assuming that incentive structure remains the same, then that tells you that they may not be as willing to lend to households, um, you know, going forward. So, so I'm not saying by them buying treasuries that they're predicting recession. What I'm saying is that from a risk return perspective, it's more attractive for them to hold treasuries than to lend to to uh, to households. And so, 
you said you've gotten out of the flattener trade. Flattener, I guess, is, is just a relative spread between you think short-term rates are going to go up more than long-term rates on a, base, on a basis. I take it the short-term rates going up, you think that could be a, a little bit gotten ahead of itself. What's your view on the long, long-term rates? I mean, 10-year, 30-year, sort of pick, pick, your, pick your poison. But if you expect a recession is coming, typically the call is to buy bonds. But does that make sense when, when inflation is, is so high? You know, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think um, this is uh, quite a tricky kind of environment. But what what I would say is, you know, markets often look at the trends in macro variables. So what we've seen over the last, say, 12 months is that both growth and inflation has been picking up, both. They've both been just going up. Now, you know, uh, growth is, you know, got to like 11 12 percent you know in q2 last year and then you know was four five percent by q4 so it's still very high levels higher much higher than what we're used to and inflation's got to seven percent now the next 12 months what we're going to see is falling inflation so even people who believe that inflation is going to be high no one is expects inflation to be at seven percent at the end of this year yes Consensus forecasts, so the average of economists on the street, is that inflation will end the year around three, three and a half percent. So a fall in the inflation rate. Um, and so directionally, inflation will be falling this year. On top of that, growth will also be falling this year. You know, again, most people expect that as well. So, so now we're in an environment where growth will be falling over the course of the year. Inflation will also be falling over the course of the year. So even though inflation is still high, 3% is still high, it's falling. And so in that context, it will be easier for rates markets to rally in, in that environment. Um, so so Maybe that's where kind of, bond prices go up. So yields, yeah, yields, yields to uh, go down and bond prices to, to go up in, in that environment. Um, now the 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 main kind of caveat there is obviously there's still you know recession is not going to happen next month it's going to happen in my view towards the end of this year if there is a recession so there's a there's a lot of runway before we get to that point um but it does tell you the context in which bond yields will go down wouldn't necessarily be one where inflation rates are rising inflation rates will be falling um and 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 my sense is markets in general find it very hard to distinguish between inflation falling to three, inflation falling to two, inflation falling to four. The market doesn't really differentiate much between those different outcomes. It, it just says, okay, inflation is falling. Really, what do, what do you mean by that? Like what, what uh, asset price or, or derivative or swap are you looking at that makes you say that? Um, yeah, I mean, what I would say is that if you look at, say, the rates markets um, or even equity markets, in general, if um, the markets, in my experience, tends to focus much more on the direction of the trend, not not the end destination point. Yes. So, so if I if if I was to say, you know, if if I myself was to think, okay, inflation could be two percent this year at the end of this year, um, and somebody else says three percent, the markets are going to behave probably in the same way if it's either two or three percent because it's it's falling from seven percent. That. That's a, that's a big sort of decline. Um, so the interesting point would be: Are there people? What? What? Or should I put it another way? What scenario could we see where inflation could stay at seven percent by the end of this year? So that's the real inflation sort of environment. You know that that you stay at seven percent all year, and so that's the scenario I'd be thinking about. Like, what could cause that? You know, one thing that could cause that would be if oil prices went to one fifty two hundred dollars. I think that that could cause that. Um, another thing that could cause that would be um, if we saw um, quite a dramatic uh, change in um, uh, medical, like some of the services side. So that's medical prices, owner equivalent rent, all of them really shot up in a dramatic way. Um, uh, that could be another way we could sort of stay at 7%. Uh, another one is if we saw the dollar collapse, you know, in a quite dramatic fashion. The rationale for a dollar collapse would be, I am actually quite, I am actually bearish on the dollar this year. So last year the dollar went up, but I think this year we're in an interesting environment where the dollar will actually, I think, will fall. And that's interesting, Bilal, because you normally, uh, during, normally during slowdowns, capital rushes to the uh, to the United States for a, a sort of a safe haven. So you, that's a little bit of a contrarian view. And I'm, I'm very curious, why do you think that during a slowdown, the dollar will perform poorly? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that's a sort of good point. Um, I think one of the big reasons is that if you look at what helped the dollar last year, a large part of what helped the dollar last year was that 
um, rest of the world growth was weaker than the US. So the US had relatively strong growth partly helped by the fiscal and the rest of the world, including, say, China and Europe, had relatively weak growth because those countries were doing lots of restrictions on COVID. And the US had a very front loaded fiscal and the rest of the world didn't. So there was a relative growth advantage for the US. And from a capital flow perspective, um, foreigners piled into US equities over the last uh, couple of years. And US investors who normally invest abroad uh, were bringing money home in order to invest in US markets. So you had this kind of perfect uh, environment for the dollars to do very well. Then on top of that, the Fed had a pivot last year from being dovish to hawkish, and that really helped the dollar. Now this year, I think all of those things are turning around where the as the pandemic eases, the rest of the world will get a bigger boost to growth than the US um, because they had more restrictions than the US currently does. So they'll get a bigger kicker on growth. Uh, these flows into U.S. equities will start to reverse because U.S. equities aren't doing so well. So you, you, you get some loss there. And then also the rest of the world has also started to raise rates as well. So suddenly the U.S. isn't the only country that's raising rates. So so that, that gives you an environment where the dollar could weaken in an environment of relative U.S. weakness. Now, if we see a very sharp U.S. recession, the dollar would probably would strengthen in, in that environment. Now, the situation where it wouldn't would be um, if you look at, say, uh, something like uh, 1994, the Fed hiked in 1994, you had a couple of crises, you had the Mexico crisis and so on, and the dollar dollar got hit hard. Um, so that that's a period where you had the Fed hiking and the dollar did really poorly in, in that, that year. So the dollar doesn't always uh, strengthen in crisis periods. It also sort of depends on the nature of the crisis as well. And does your weak dollar view bleed out into the equity market where you're more bearish on U.S. stocks than those in, let's say, Europe, China or other emerging markets? Yeah, I would say so. Yes. I mean, I would say I'd be probably more positive in Europe than the U.S. because I think uh, the European growth profile this year will be more balanced than the U.S. And there's more for reopening uh, tailwind for for U.S. Uh, for European stocks than the U.S. Um, and and then also because European interest rates are going up and the European uh, index is more skewed towards financials, that's really going to help European banks in particular because Europe's had negative rates for a long time. That's really bad for banks. And that's that's starting to turn. That, that helps. Now, on China, um, Chinese stocks are obviously very undervalued. But my fundamental issue with Chinese stocks is that the Chinese system is such that um, authorities aren't necessarily incentivized to keep Chinese stock markets strong. You know, they have a different incentive structure. So even if Chinese growth stabilizes a bit, it's not clear to me that Chinese growth will necessarily, Chinese stocks will necessarily do well, you know, partly because there's been a clampdown on the private sector, partly because uh, the the leverage process in China is changing because of weakness in the property sector. So so the visibility on Chinese stocks is very quite poor right now. And so I wouldn't necessarily bet on um, Chinese stocks, uh, even if China was to stabilize somewhat this year. Mm. And then Japan and other emerging markets, like let's say Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa, Russia. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of stocks, I think Japanese stocks could do quite well uh, this year. I think the growth picture looks quite positive. Um, uh, Brazil as well. Um, Brazil, in some ways, is a commodity play uh, as well. I mean, the only issue for Brazil is that one is the central bank is raising rates fairly aggressively now, which could start to hurt the equity markets. Plus, also, we get Brazilian elections later this year as well. So there are some risks there. But in general, I would say that I'd probably favor European stocks over US. EM stocks, I'd be more cautious on because in general, if you have a cautious view on risk, EM equities are at the more sort of higher end of the risk side. Yeah, and EM stocks just got really, really taken to the cleaners uh, in 2014 when the Fed started started tapering. Um, so it's like in the theme with the you know monetary tightening. Oh uh, well, Bilal, you've got you're really generous with the time, but I've, I've got to uh, have you on for you know a few more minutes just just to talk crypto. Um, just to start with, how did you start? What was your first view on crypto when you when you learned about it? Did your views change? And then also. How do you think about it as, is it a macro asset within sort of the, the panoply of the cross asset, the interest rates, the, the, the currencies, the equities, the commodities? Is it a commodity? Is it a currency as, you know, the Bitcoin white paper sort of, you know, indicated? Uh, now, a lot, now a lot of people think about it as commodity, but now it's, you know, as a more institutional adoption, it's just yet another button that, you know, a hedge fund manager can press to sell. So you got the rising correlation. So let's, a lot, a lot we can get into, but let's just start with how, how did you start, how did you first learn about crypto and how's your view evolved? 
Well, I, I, you know, I learned about crypto as soon as it got launched, uh, Bitcoin got launched, you know, back uh, soon after the global financial crisis. And, and back then it was more as a curiosity on the side. I wasn't that engaged in it. You know, a few people I know who are kind of very sort of geeky computer, you know, programmer type people telling me about it. And in some ways I, I dismissed it, kind of thinking, okay, it's a nice quirky little thing on the side. Um, then I started to follow it, you know, in subsequent years as it became more popular and then more people around me suddenly started to say they've become super rich on, on Bitcoin. So that perked up my interest. But it's really only been over the past, say, two, maybe two or three years that I've taken it much more seriously. So before that, I was kind of viewing it more as, OK, this is an interesting little speculative asset in the corner. Um, and it's only really over the last two, three years where I'm thinking that actually it is a major asset class that we have to consider. And the reason for that was one was just the length of time Bitcoin in particular has been around for. Um, and then also with the creation of Ethereum, suddenly it became a bit clearer that there's some um, use cases for crypto as well. It's not just this digital gold. With, with Ethereum, which in some ways is a decentralized computer, um, you can suddenly see, okay, with smart contracts that um, are decentralized, you could start to have some interesting use cases emerge. And we've seen NFTs as one use case. You know, we've, we, you know, uh, see the DeFi world as well. So that suddenly says, OK, there is something here. Um, so I've been focusing on it, you know, a lot, a lot over the last year or two. And but the way I approach this is, you know, rather than a lot of crypto enthusiasts, I'm, I'm a kind of uh, crypto realist, you could say, you know, where I, I, you know, I don't think necessarily crypto will will change the world, but I'm viewing it like, uh, an asset class like a tech stock or a currency or a commodity and it's all of those things and and more in some ways it's like a venture capital thing as well it's a philosophy and, and so on um but you know being a student of history what you know is that at the beginning of new technologies you always have these idealists you know who think this will kind of get rid of authoritarian structures it will be you know a great kind of libertarian anarchic you know revolution that will happen but soon it gets co-opted by the establishment and that's what's happening with crypto as well that it's entering the mainstream because the establishment entities whether it's traditional banks traditional hedge funds the average guy on the street they start to adopt it um, and then suddenly lots of those original philosophies get thrown to the wayside and that that remains kind of a niche thing so suddenly it kind of enters more of the classical investment framework and my aim really has been to apply you know rigorous you know investment analysis that we do on equity markets or on fx and apply it to crypto and you know the reason for doing that is one is you know we're very experienced at doing that you know you know having done research for a long time but when i look at the crypto world there's just a lot of you know people who just uh, making crazy claims about crypto. You know, you see that on YouTube, on TikTok, on Twitter, wherever, people are making all sorts of outlandish claims. And many of them are just charlatans. And so there's a need, I think, to have a voice in the crypto world that, you know, w number one, accepts crypto as a, an asset class, but then apply some rigor to it to kind of manage people's expectations and guide people in that whole process. Because at the moment, it's, it's kind of polarized. You either have people who just hate crypto and just say, stay away from it completely. Or on the other side, you have people who say, oh, Bitcoin's going to go to a million, ditch all your traditional assets and become a billionaire. And I think, you know, there's a need to be somewhere in between. Definitely. Uh, Bilal, how, to, uh, how do you explain the huge bull run that crypto has had uh, really, let's say, starting in March of 2020. I know Bitcoin was one of the first macro assets to bottom, I think, on March 9th. And, you know, since then until, oh, I don't know, March or April of 2021, it was just a huge uh, straight run up, the uh, phenomenal returns. And, of course, the uh, lesser well-known, uh, lesser dominant, I guess, uh, project, you can say, uh, Ethereum, Solana, have had returns way even higher than that. Uh, a lot of people at the time, I think, explained it by, the expansion of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, the central bank balance sheet. Um, to what degree do you think that is at play? Is it adoption by institutions? Is it not really having to do with macro variables that we've been talking about today, you know, interest rates at all, or a fiscal sort of what, what has been responsible for, you know, Bitcoin going from 3000 to like 60,000? Well, I think there's a few reasons. You know, one is I do think that the Fed cutting rates to zero and central banks doing that around the world definitely 
made it much easier to finance investments into crypto as it did into tech and VC and everything. So the context was low interest rates, which really does help asset classes that don't have any inherent returns. So if you have an asset class or a company that doesn't have any profits, cutting rates to zero really helps those types of markets. So one is I think the Fed did help in that in that way. And that was a big reason why. And sorry, Bilal, can you, can you briefly explain why, why cutting, cutting rates to zero helps assets that don't have inherent return? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, if, um, if you have, um, if you have an asset that uh, gives you, you know, 0% annual uh, coupons or dividends or zero every year, or you have another that gives you say 2% dividends every year, if interest rates, um, uh, and, 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 and on top of that, if there's no chance of pro no chance of profits in the next three, four years, but there are chances of profits in the next 20 years, if you have 10% interest rates, then the opportunity cost of you putting your money into a loss making uh, business for the next five years is, is quite high because if interest are 10%, you're gonna, you're going to give up 50% or 60% returns for the next four or five years in order to wait for the profits to come in that investment. Now, if interest are zero, the opportunity cost is zero for the next four or five years. It doesn't matter. Like if you just put it in cash, you learn zero. And so you can wait for those five years. So in, in some ways, this is kind of what you know, low rates does. It basically says that assets that give you returns way in the future, whether that's in dividends or coupons or some new use cases in the future, some future metaverse, 0% interest rates, you know, essentially uh, allows you to put a larger weight on, on the far future than on the near future. But if interest rates were 10%, then you suddenly put a lot more weight on what's going to happen in the next few years because it's too expensive for you to give up that 10% interest rate every year to to put something into into something like that. So that that's kind of rough, roughly how how to think about that. So so one is zero percent interest rates really helps asset classes that have some kind of future return, far future return. Now, the other thing that helped a lot was retail adoption, for sure, you know, because suddenly um, people, you know, were flush with cash because of, you know, the governments and everything. They were stuck at home. And what could they do? You know, so they could watch Netflix or they could trade stocks, you know. So it's no coincidence that uh, uh, the, the rally in crypto coincided with a rally in meme stocks and small cap stocks. Uh, it all kind of happened at the same time. It's a great, great point. I just add that uh, while institutional investors, a lot, a lot of whom you work with, view volatility as a drag, that's something that threatens their returns, variance drag and the like, a lot of individual investors actually are attracted to things that can move up and down because it can be quite exciting. And there's the chance for very large gains. Sorry, go ahead. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and the good you know, thing about Bitcoin is the volatility in Bitcoin is around 80, 90%, you know, whereas say... The S&P 500 volatility is, say, around 20%. So, you know, with 80% volatility, that means that in the space of a few days, you can make a 5% return or 10% return in a week. You you can make quite easily. And that's oh, very, very, and that's quite day, powerful. Yeah. In, in a day, you can make that in, in a day. And so that's quite powerful, you know, if you're like a retail person and you've just suddenly seen your money go up 10% in, in, in a few days. So it feels like you can get rich very quickly. There's nothing more powerful to people than a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, and, and so I think the retail adoption, because uh, it was easier to to uh, trade crypto, they had more money and they were stuck at home, nothing else to do, that, that made it easier as well. Then the third factor, I think, was institutional adoption, that suddenly you had large institutions saying, okay, we have to get into crypto. And so you had the launch of some ETF funds, some you know asset managers saying they want to invest as well. So that, that certainly helped uh, as well. And then um, I think also um, you saw um, just um, because of the nature of COVID, as I said earlier, that really uh, forced everybody to think about remote, cloud, everything became much more sort of technology driven. And what we saw was a, just a huge amount of innovation uh, occurring in the crypto space. So you saw uh, the development of more um uh, smart contract coins, alternative to Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, and so on, they really started to take off. You saw Metaverse really take off as well. You saw DeFi take off, uh, NFTs get launched. So you just had a, a huge explosion of activity in that space, which suddenly 
you know made there more opportunities for people to 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 invest in so i think all of these things kind of came together at, at this time yeah and you've got a chart uh, um from one of your mac- uh, research pieces from macro hive that compares different crypto indices different aspects of crypto starting i believe from january of 2021 and bitcoin has gone up uh you know and then this is from a few days ago oh uh, you know only 47 percent uh, you know outperform the s p uh and the nasdaq um and you know most most stocks uh DeFi has gone up 729 percent uh smart contracts have gone up 1726 percent and metaverse index and again we can get in what is the metaverse index how are you comprised composing this uh is up seven thousand two hundred and sixty one percent so how do you have you made sense of that dispersion between returns yeah, I know. Is, is that a few crazy, some of those returns? I mean, first, just some context for this all, which was that what I found was that as crypto has matured, um, it's, it's become very evident that different crypto markets behave differently. And so I felt there was a need to introduce more transparency to the crypto market. And one thing we know from other financial markets is that having an index that represents some kind of benchmark for markets helps you just clarify what's going on. So there's like the S&P 500, there's a small cap index, there's European index. So we did that basically to the crypto world. And essentially we've launched you know, three indices. One is a smart contract index, which has things like Ethereum, Solana, Cardano. So all of these smart contract tokens, and we see the performance of that. Then we have the metaverse one, which is made up of virtual worlds like Gala, Decentraland, um, and GameFi, you know, gaming uh, type coins. And then we have DeFi, so lending and borrowing, yield farming type type coins. So, so we wanted to kind of see how do they perform. And as you said, with the returns you just reported, the returns are, are really quite different. There's quite big dispersion. So in some ways, Bitcoin even though it's it's very volatile and the returns are still quite big, in some ways that behaves like a mature market. It, it's like the, the large cap of, 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 it's like Apple. It's just, you know, it's steady, solid returns. And then, then smart contracts, um, uh, then smart contracts and DeFi are kind of the next, you know, wave of delivering strong returns. So there's a lot of activity there. They deliver much stronger returns than Bitcoin. But what's blown, you know, but all of these get blown away by Metaverse, you know, which is the like the really speculative high end, you know, high octane end of, of the crypto world, um, which is partly ironically accelerated by Facebook changing its name to Meta last year, which, you know, ironically kind of was like a traditional company suddenly rebranding itself led to meta exploding higher metaverse coins exploding higher as everybody suddenly said okay what what is this metaverse so so in some ways we you could say bitcoin is like the apple you know, the safe haven so to speak of crypto then you have kind of ethereum solana cardano smart contract defies where there's something real there something a bit more tangible you can see the lending you can see fees associated with it and they give you higher returns than say bitcoin but the really speculative end where it's unclear what the returns are because people are buying expensive land in in virtual in virtual territory and who knows whether that virtual territory will still exist in the future or, or whether anyone will care that's that's where the high risk high returns are and Bilal, I'm curious are your indices that you've created at macrohive are they carry adjusted so for example if you look up uh, BRL USD the Brazilian real to the US dollar the Brazilian real has uh, depreciated a ton against the dollar over the past uh, 10 years. However, uh, this is the point of carry. If you had owned Brazilian real denominated fixed income instruments yielding 12%, you actually would have done okay. So for example, I know DeFi, you know, the yields can get quite high. So is your DeFi uh, um, index, which you know, has returned 729% and it's in red, is that adjusting for, oh, on Uniswap, you can get this 15% yield or is it just the pure prices? In this case, it's the pure prices because in order for you to earn that 15%, you have to stake the, the coin. Um, so there's an extra step you have to do to earn that higher yield. So what we're doing is we're saying that, okay, if you just buy the coin on on a, on a normal platform, uh, this is the return you'll get. Now, if you do some an additional step, if you stake it or if you do something else with it, um, then you'll get an additional return. We don't include that because it requires an additional assumption. But in general, the, the the price returns are so high that in the case of crypto, it will swamp 
ten percent yield or, or, or things like that. You know, in the case of Brazil, though, the yield is very important because the FX volatility and the yield kind of are comparable in some ways. Mm. Yes, and you have a recent piece out that is quite constructive on Ethereum. In fact, it's called "We Turn Bullish Ethereum" out uh, February tenth of this year on Macro Hive, and you note four Ethereum specific metrics that. Uh, you are attracted to. You write that you like the valuations with an MVRZ Z score currently at 1.18. What is an MVRZ score? And then how do you go about valuing something that you know doesn't really have a, a cash flow? And to be clear, you know, staking something at a, that, that's different than like a company earning money from like you know doing things. So yeah, yeah. I mean that ratio. It, it's it's much more treacherous trying to come up with a valuation for you know for crypto. So what we do in this case is we look at this that that measure is almost like a price to book ratio. You know where we say okay, what is the the book value? What price did people buy Ethereum at in total? Like if you add up all the people, whether they were early people or late people, what's kind of the average price they bought it at versus the current price of 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 ethereum and so when that ratio is very low that means the price to book is very low you could say and uh you know we don't know is 1.1 the magic number is 0.8 the magic number 0.3 we don't know but based on recent history at least it seems like around one ish is the magic number in which case that often coincides with turning points so it, it's a crude measure of valuation you could say so it's kind of it's it's not something benjamin graham devised it, it's it's something more like in the equity world to be something like a technical something similar to a technical right or, yeah yeah be more yeah, similar yeah, okay. to that absolutely yeah okay so that's the that's the uh mvrz score it's interesting i i didn't know that very interesting uh then you talk about futures open interest uh rising in the derivatives market you talk about the put call ratio flattening out and then the hash rate registering at all new time highs talk to me about what what that means and then how it factors into your 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 analysis and outlook yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so we we monitor futures activity. So this is activity of futures, uh, Ethereum futures on all the major exchanges, whether it's a traditional exchange or crypto exchanges. And typically, when the activity goes up, that generally means, um, it, it, I mean, generally, I mean, there's some caveats. It generally means that people are suddenly starting to get more interested in Ethereum again. So when Ethereum prices were falling, open interest starts to fall as people start to run away thinking we don't want to touch this. As it picks up again, that tends to be a bullish signal. So that that's what we're seeing there. Then the put call ratio is essentially there is an options market, um, a derivatives market, an options market on, on some of the major crypto uh, markets. And when Ethereum was falling, there was a lot of demand for puts for, for people betting on declines in Ethereum prices. And you can compare that to the price of calls, so people making bets on the price going up. And the skew was heavily towards the puts. And now, in the last few weeks, we're suddenly seeing that demand is starting to switch away from puts towards calls. So that's telling you that um, the direction investors want to go in is more towards the upside in Ethereum, which is constructive. Then the final point, as you mentioned, is hash rate. And the way to think about hash rate is just how much uh, computing power is being devoted to Ethereum's, the Ethereum system. A very bearish signal would be that if Ethereum prices are falling and the hash rate is falling, that's telling you that people are removing their computers away from the system, which is, a, which is bad for, obviously, for the Ethereum system. But ironically, or interestingly, even as Ethereum has been falling, the hash rate has it been going higher and higher and higher? Um, and so there's a lot more, you know, uh, computing power devoted to, to Ethereum, even though the price has been falling. So these are all very constructive signals. But the twist is that unlike lots of, you know, crypto um, focused um, organizations, we combine these crypto specific factors with macro factors, because our view is that is not just crypto factors that drive crypto. You have to contextualize it in a macro environment. You know, what's the Fed doing? What's the risk appetite in investors? You know, does equities look more attractive than crypto? And so we also look at macro factors. We've got correlations. We look at is crypto behaving like gold or is it behaving more like a tech stock? Uh, we look at all of these other dynamics and then we combine the two sides together. So we give kind of a score for the macro side and a score for the crypto specific side. And then we put them together to come up with an overall view. So our macro view on crypto is negative because you know the Fed and all the defensive things we talked about, but our crypto factors are positive. And as it happens, the crypto factors are, are just 
we are just more positive than the macro negative factor. So if you combine the two together, it's made us turn go from neutral Ethereum to being bullish on Ethereum. Not massively bullish, but but like bullish on on Ethereum as when we sort of look at everything holistically. Bilal, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure having you on Forward Guidance. Uh, I recommend people you know can check you out on Twitter at Bilal Hafiz123, at Macro Hive, at Macro underscore Hive, excuse me. Um, Bilal, thank you so much. Pleasure. It's great speaking to you.